Thanks, Mo. Earlier this afternoon, I said that the success of the web comes from how it enables human interaction. And a key part of that is trust. To build a secure web for the future, we need to rethink the role that the individual has in creating and controlling their data. Alex Sandy Pentland is Professor of Media Arts and Sciences at MIT. He helped create and direct MIT's Media Lab, the Media Lab Asia, and the Center for Future Health. Sandy will talk to us this afternoon about a sustainable digital ecology. Sandy? Great, thank you. So 20 years ago, um, we began hearing about ubiquitous computing and the web was starting. And in response, I built the first race of cyborgs. So we had people running around with head-mounted displays and six-volt batteries. And you know, it was crazy stuff. Um, eventually ended up in Google Glass and things like that. The students that did that uh, invented a lot of wearable computing. And about 10 years ago, we started playing with the very first smartphones. And we did things like you see up there. Um, could I have a click on that? So these are people moving around in San Francisco. Uh, and what we did is the analysis on this. Um, so, so the big dots are the most popular restaurants and bars and so forth. And if you begin analyzing this, you find places that people go that are in common. You find groups of people or tribes. And that's really interesting because from the tribe, from the places that people go, you can first of all tell what they buy because you know whether they like fast food or you know, all natural or whatever. But you can also tell their sexual orientation. You can credit score them. You know their likelihood of developing diabetes you know their likelihood of developing alcoholism. And I realized that this was really dangerous in a way that the web has never been. In the web, you write things in there. Searching is a little dodgy because maybe you, you uh, show things by what you search for. But this is really uh, very implicit. Just by living your life, someone who's watching this data can know more about you than you likely know about yourself. Now that's great in some ways because we can do things like address challenges for diabetes, we can help make the world a lot better in a lot of ways, but what I realize is unless we change the basic way that the web operates, there was gonna be reactive legislation that was gonna wash this all away. It was gonna get locked down. People were gonna say, no, we're not having any of this Internet of Things thing, we're not going to have people being tracked. We're just going to tie it down, right? And all the good things would be last, lost. So what I did is I, uh, let's see if we can make this work, started a, a, a conversation in Davos, the World Economic Forum, among people like the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission, the Justice Commissioner of Europe, uh, people from the Central Committee in China, all sorts of countries, along with chairman of Vodafone, uh, CEO of some of the major banks and on and on about what can we do about this because what was required was sort of a win-win-win solution. Um, the governments had to feel comfortable about it, representing citizens in terms of security and other concerns. The citizens, you and me, have to feel like we're not being spied on and we're not at risk of identity theft. How many identities were sold, stolen this year? Half a billion? Hmm, interesting, okay? And of course, companies have to be able to make money. And the way I started this group is through a suggestion that I call the New Deal on Data, um, which is really uh, giving citizens or customers the rights to know something about the data and to control it. In other words, to have at least some ownership rights in it. Uh, another sort of more colorful way to describe it is Today we live in a world that's very medieval. Uh, there's lots of data about you, but you don't own it. You don't even know what it is. It's sort of like serfdom in the Middle Ages. And what we want to do is to move to something that's more like a digital democracy. And only then will it be an ecology that's sustainable, because only then are you going to have the sort of political buy-in that will leave it 
free, leave it unfettered. Without that, the sort of disturbances we've seen in the political force are only going to increase. The key to this is giving people things like the ability to know what's being collected, the ability to have some say in it, and, and to profit from it if it's made it through better services or, or literally profit from it as the data is disposed of. And those together form the medieval common law uh, notion of ownership. They're not the, quite the same legally. But what we've done with this is we've built um, from these discussions, we've come to the notion of trust networks, and I know that's a, a term that's used in many ways, but using some of the examples of networks out there that allow peer-to-peer -peer communication in trusted ways. We built a system called Open Personal Data Store, which I'm proud to say is held uh, as a uh, uh, sort of uh, by the Kerberos Internet uh, Consortium as a sort of prototype standard that I hope you guys will become interested in. It has several characteristics. One is that there's a legal architecture that goes with it. And when you say legal, people go, oh my god, my head hurts, right? Um, but using only contract law, which is pretty much the same everywhere in the world. So the web is one thing that's interoperable. Contract law really is pretty inoperable across all different countries. That's so that people can make money. And there are examples of networks that are both technical and legal that are rather amazing. The SWIFT network is one. So people know about the SWIFT network, I hope. That's the interbank transfer network, $3 trillion a day. Now, if I were going to go steal money, that's where I would go, right? Three trillion bucks? You, if you could take that money for a second, you could buy an island, right? But as far as we know, it's never been hacked. Now, why is that? And same thing is true with the uh, Visa interbank network. As far as we know, it really has never been hacked in a significant way. Why? Because for each bit of communication, there's a term in a legal contract that goes one-to-one -one with it. I send you a message, a very particular pattern message. That's the offer of a contract. If you reply in a particular patterned way, that's a signed contract. And now both of us have liability. And since you're part of the network, too, you have liability, too. You are going to watch us really closely, <laughs> OK, as is everybody else. There seems to be something about this marriage of contract law and digital uh, structure that is quite robust. Another idea is um, that we need to have better authentication. Uh, and what we've managed to do is talk the US military uh, through uh, MITRE into releasing Open, um, uh, Open ID Connect, which is something that they developed to have better authentication services. It's also something that's a, in, uh, an example of the things that were talked about for the national strategy for trusted identity in cyberspace, which we helped uh, co-chair. So it's a way of actually propagating authentication uh, that gets rid of the need for passwords in many ways. Ooh ha that's good, right? And along with that, this architecture includes auditability, because you have to be able to check up on people. That's part of this sort of legal mindset. If I give you a license to use some of my data, I have to be able to check that you did the right thing. You can't be given my data to other places, other people. And the third thing is that it has a trusted compute cell where rather than giving you answers, like giving you my GPS coordinate, if you need to know, am I in San Francisco or not, I'll tell you yes or no, one bit. If you knew my GPS coordinates, you could do all sorts of things. So it's reducing the dimensionality and the richness data down to the minimum. This is not a perfect answer to security, but what you're doing is you're trying to build sort of the protection on the consumer side, on the citizen side, so, and limit the distribution of information to build greater trust. So that's the architecture. Um, it includes one more thing, which I like uh, to illustrate using this quote. Uh, this is by the person who's in charge of the National Security Agency. And he says, the Snowden affair uh, had to come up, of course, right? One mistake was giving Snowden access to all that data. But that's the small mistake. 
He says the big mistake was sticking all the data in one place. Because when you stick all your data in one place, I know where to go. And the question to ask yourself is, how many other Snowdens were there who didn't broadcast it, they just sold the data? OK, yeah. Well, now, how many of you work for companies that have one big data store? Oh, let's see, that's why maybe the half a billion identities were stolen this year? Hmm. <laughs> There are ways of building things in a distributed fashion where, yes, you're going to get attacked, yes, you're going to lose things, but you never lose the whole thing. And that's the type of architecture that we're, we're pushing for. So we've built this, um, a couple of different versions of this. As I said, Kerberos is beginning to support this. Um, and what we do with it is we deploy it in different places. So we've deployed it, deploying it at MIT to try and eat our own dog food? Can we manage uh, student services and the infrastructure using this more sort of trusted net? Uh, we're working with the Mass General Hospital to see if we can't make um, medical services much more in control of the patient and not just the hospital. Um, and we work with telcos, for instance, in this experiment here, which is in northern Italy, uh, Trento, uh, with Telecom Italia and Telefonica, I'm on the board of, I should mention, um, and the local municipal authority and the local stores to be able to share data in a very different way than you and I can today. And so we've deployed this for young families and now for seniors. And what we are trying to do is change the risk reward ratio for sharing by making a more trusted infrastructure on top of the existing uh, web. And let me give you a couple of examples of what people do. Uh, this example is actually in the United States. We, uh, share, we measured and shared mental health data among returning soldiers uh, in the US military. So you can actually use your phone to be able to assess whether you're behaving normally. And it comments on your mental health. Now, if you're a soldier, Sharing that data with anybody is verboten because it's the end of your career with very bad consequences. But we had over 100 soldiers come back, measure this data, and share it with other guys on their pl platoon in an anonymous way. We had high 90% opt-in because what it resulted in was the soldiers could compare themselves to other soldiers and know whether they were doing well or doing poorly and whether they should seek help. It was very successful. Um, for those of you that have young kids, this is something that the young families in Italy did, is they would post the locations of their kids on the net. Now, how many of you put your <laughs> the locations of your children <laughs> out on the web, right? You'd be a damn fool if you do. Um, but in a world where you can control how your data is distributed and you can audit it, in a trusted net, a trusted web, you can begin to do that. And in fact, these young families were blazingly enthusiastic about it. And again, in the high 90% of the families did it. Because everybody with young kids faces the problem, well, what are we going to do with the kids this weekend? Well, you'd like to go someplace where there are other kids and maybe some adults you know so that you, you're not faced with the, the problem of chasing the little kid and nothing to do. So that's what they were doing is they were using this to agree among their friends by sharing data anonymously but with only their friendship networks about where the kids would be. Or this is another one that they loved. Um, do you spend as much money on transportation as your friends? Who knows? That's because you don't share financial information, right? It's dangerous to do that, and it's sort of not in the culture. But if you have a trusted web, something where you can determine where the data goes and whether it's anonymous, you can do that. And so these young families in Italy shared things like, how much do you spend on transportation? How much do you spend on rent? Which doctors do you go to? Which schools are the good ones? Which, you know, on and on and on. There's all sorts of very personal data that you normally don't share that these people were willing to do. So I think that begins to suggest that if we build a trusted web, 
by using some of these techniques, they will come and we'll end up with a nicer world all the way around. Um, and so that's what I mean about towards a sustainable digital ecology. And uh, thank you. <laughs>